Okay, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good morning. Uh, welcome here to the seventh floor of the Fine Arts Building. My name is Blair Thomas. I'm the director of Puppet Festival, and uh, we decided to move our talk to uh, the smaller studio, so there will be standing room only. <laughs> I can say standing room only, symposium. Uh, but anyway, guests have a seat. Uh, so uh, thank you for coming out. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's, it's a great opportunity to just take a moment and to hear from the artists themselves uh, how they come at making their work. Um, and so uh, all the, the panelists are being presented this weekend, so hopefully you get a chance to see their work. Um, things that I just want to point out is we have uh, uh, a, a an, out, an indoor and outdoor performance at two o'clock down at the uh, National Museum of Mexican Art uh, by La Liga Teatro Elastico. Uh, and maybe in case you don't know, but maybe you do, on the fourth floor, our, our regular studio is a little cafe and we've got some, you can get a, a light lunch or a light dinner there and uh, a coffee and whatnot. And we have a couple exhibits, so check that out as well. So. Um, uh, so uh, I have been working for a couple years with uh, Paulette Richards, and, and, uh, and uh, which is excellent. Thank you. <laughs> and so uh, Paulette and I dreamed up this this kind of focus to this uh, these panel discussions, and we have four of them. This is the first of them, and uh, and and she has taken the ball and run with it. And so now I will turn it over to Paulette. Thank you, Blair. <laughs> Good morning and thank everyone for coming out on this chilly Chicago day. <laughs> um, so our theme for this year is the materiality of the puppet. And we came to that because we'd been exploring more of the metaphysics of the puppet and some people thought that that was getting a little off in the weeds. <laughs> <laughs> and so we're going to bring it back down to earth and talk stuff for the whole Ellen Van Volkenberg um, Puppetry Symposium series. And as you know, whenever you get puppeteers together, that's what the conversation turns to. There's been a uh, conversation just up here now about this new material called Panther something or other. Panther cloth. Yes, Panther cloth. So, th <laughs> so that's what we're doing um, this morning. Um, I had originally planned that the artists would give you a nice PowerPoint about their work and then we'd have question and answer, but um, being artists, <laughs> I had trouble getting <laughs> slides out of them. <laughs> and so we're gonna, um, we're gonna do a more informal approach. So I will ask each of the panelists to introduce themselves, just basically, because we have info on the website. Say your name say the show that you're in, um, and then we'll pass it down the line and get into the questions that I have for you, and off we go. So starting to my left. So just real short, just introduce. Uh, my name is Terrish Pipkins, a.k.a. Jaghetto, a creator of the hip hopera Spinocchio. Hi, I'm Matthew Garrick, and our show is uh, Italo Calvino's Invisible Cities. Uh, I'm Dan Kerhobert, and I'm also working on uh, Invisible Cities. I'm Michael Vogel and Charlotte Wilde, and we are here with the show Spleen and the Krabbat. <laughs> I want to, because I'm the only yes. female artist here, and I'm only assisting. Uh, I'm a musician, so that's why I'm only here to translate if it's necessary. <laughs> okay, so I hope you get a chance to see all of these wonderful shows. Um, I am blown away by the mechanical genius that is sitting here before you. And so the first question I'm gonna ask, I, I will frame it first. Um, I got into the world of puppetry as co-curator of an exhibit with Dr. John Bell, the Living Objects African American Puppetry Exhibit that was at the Ballard Institute and Museum of Puppetry in 2018, 2019. That was my debut as a curator 
And I was very concerned that people might come to the exhibit and leave going, well, that was a tacky bunch of puppets. <laughs> and, so, and so my question uh, was, what makes a beautiful puppet? And the answers that I consistently got from puppeteers was, it moves well in performance. And so, um, of course, in order to move well, you have to design a mechanism. So I'm going to ask each of the artists to pick one puppet in their show, talk about the movement that you wanted the puppet to do, and the mechanism that you designed so that it could at least approximate that movement. Who wants it? You, do we want to go down in order, or somebody wants to jump in right away? Still thinking. <laughs> <laughs> we've got uh, we've got about 19, so I'm trying to pull I'm trying to pull them all out. Okay. Um, uh, one that, uh, and just one more time, one that uh, we think moves well and how we design. Well, it. it doesn't. I mean, sometimes we 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 live with something that didn't quite do what we wanted it to do, oh, yeah. but maybe yeah. the design yeah. problems were interesting. So. I've got one. I got one. Yeah. yeah. yeah um, it would. Trying to explain my puppetry is like, I say it's like the matrix, I have to show you. So to actually talk about what I do without seeing an image, it's, it's difficult, but the thing is, oh, you have something here? Uh, the T-Rex right there. Okay, let's see if we can move him on. Oh, it counts. Oh, yay. Yay. Uh, this is a prototype that I've built. Uh, I love dinosaurs ever since a little kid, so when I started building, I started building dinosaurs. <laughs> yeah, blow it up a little bit. Shining but um, my puppets are always a, a process. They're never actually done. I've done performances where I didn't enjoy the movement or wasn't satisfied. I went straight home and took it apart and rebuilt it like that night. I'm only constantly working. If I'm not building new puppets, I'm modifying older puppets. As soon as I find a better way or a better mech to make it move better, I, I just jump right in, so that's my answer to that. Okay, uh, Cherish, it's yes. not opening, and it's also um, very tiny. Yes. <laughs> it, it, it's not a teeny tiny T Rex. <laughs> yeah, and I don't know how to solve that problem. Right clicking it's cool. on the icon uh, and see if there's a drop down menu. Okay, I have the thumb. Panel, panel, panel on this map. You might map. have put it in QuickTime, but the player is on your laptop, and you need to drag it to the other display. Ah, thank you. Got you. May I assist with a sure. thing? Sure. Okay. Thank yeah. You. I, I think I can. Sorry. <laughs> This is why our show is like sometimes. Yes. <laughs> no, th th this that, is my show last night. Yes, right. <laughs> All right. Yay. Yay. Thank you. Can you make it bigger? You can press the green thing to make it bigger. Yeah. Okay. Now you got it over there. Uh oh. No. <laughs> Let's just enjoy what we have. <laughs> so that is a uh, prototype that it took me uh, four or five days to build. I don't draw any blueprints or any sketches. I just start cutting and yeah. putting together and it comes out how it comes out. I just know the general creature that I'm going to build or person and then I just say go. And I've uh, discovered that cuts down on my build time because think of all the planning and sketching and thinking <laughs> that you do. I just summon the ancestors and they give me information and I use it. <laughs> That is all uh, plywood, because most of my materials are found in recycled materials. This is old plywood, all cut into pieces. The teeth are wooden dowels, and the feet are uh, two by four, cut into pieces. And it's all uh, wood stained, and the detail is uh, burned with a mini torch and a lighter. Awesome. OK, do we want to see that one more time? Yeah. OK. And um, while we run that, what movement is most distinctive of this character that absolutely had to work for you? The tongue. Yes. <laughs> the tongue is my favorite part. <laughs> 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 that's tough. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> I'm happy with it for now. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, who's next? Uh, there's um, one of yeah. our pictures. We I need to get my cursor back over onto we this. We have, if you haven't seen our show, it's a collection of, um, I guess, devices and boxes and, and um, slideshow apparatuses. And so e each story that we adapted has um, a movement that's, um, we tried to find the movement, I think, in that story. We tried to find the thing in that story that uh, implied uh, uh, an action uh, or a resolution that felt really good. So it, it was maybe a device that would be created to arrive at a resolution like Zaira. And so um, that was like where we would start with those stories. And uh, one of them uh, that is described as, you remember this city, uh, like the notes in a score of music. And so that was the jumping off point for, oh, well, what, what kind of, how can we incorporate music into this uh, city? And we then came up with different ideas. And then I was in a toy shop or a gift shop, and I had never seen these little um, hand cranky music boxes that you can punch out your own uh, strip of music. It comes with happy birthday. Um, and, and then you feed it through the machine, and then you get it to play a song. And so uh, the idea became, how can we get the visual aspect of the city to become part of the um, to become part of the, that story and what, what is that device. So it became about uh, finding an action that was appropriate to the motion that was, or uh, a device that was appropriate for the action in each city. And so Zora, I think, um, whenever we find it. But, um, oh, cool. We, um, we created a, a music box out of it and it's, um, it was very satisfying and uh, I think the resolution of it was, was very enjoyable. That's my story. Okay, I'm still looking for your images. Uh, hey, there we go. Oh. That's a slideshow. Cool. Make, Make a copy. Go to Slime Town. That's great. <laughs> Good take. Could take some time. Dan, <laughs> did you have yeah. a, did you have one? <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, totally. So yeah, the, the, for our show, we're not trying to solve like animal or human movement as much as I think Matt spoke to, like try and find imagery that supports the story. We're using a lot of dense text, so we're trying to create like an interplay between listening and watching that kind of like holds up the text. Um, so uh, it's funny to call it a mechanism, one more. Uh, but uh, we, one more. There's, a, there's a city that, that is about a city that is always disposing things and they end up living on a pile of their own. They're so obsessed with replacing things and always having new things that they end up living on a pile of trash. Uh, and so uh, in ours, we, we've uh, set it in a tissue box. Um, so uh, the mechanism for telling the story is uh, the reveal of these prints on tissues. Uh, and so we're able to create the pile of trash by discarding the images we use throughout the story, right? And I think that's like, an example of the way in which we're trying to play with like supplying imagery, almost like a, like a Canastoria or Cranky. We're using like a lot of these devices to have an image pass through and then also end up building an image for kind of the end of the, of the piece. Um, and the game for us has been like find as many different ways of telling a story ba based on the constraint of a box or a tin or a card as we can. So, uh, yeah. All right, thank you. <laughs> okay, Matthew, <laughs> uh, you brought your puppet. Yeah, but uh, uh, I think I, I choose another puppet. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> let's hear about it. Uh, it's, um, so what, is, what is a good puppet? That's the question. Right? What well, is a beautiful, <laughs> beautiful <laughs> puppet? Beautiful puppet. Uh, uh, yeah, for a beautiful puppet. Um, for me, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a puppet who teaches you something, what mm. you don't know. And it's inter an interesting point where it, where it starts, like you, you also said, so I also do, don't make sketches or a, a plan. So uh, I choose from the show what we showed yesterday, the, a little frog. It's only big like this. And as I remember, I made it only as a, as a 
as a, as a sketch. So it, I thought I want to try something as in a model. So, and I said later I will make him big and real. Yeah. Uh, so, but, but it's on stage now, it's still the, the model. <laughs> 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 and um, so, so I just made th this puppet and the puppet uh, without an idea what show it could be. So and then the, the the whole it was kind of a starting point of the spleen show that okay there are frogs and uh, so this was the first and then the the, the content came that the, because the director that we worked with came into my workshop said oh, I I love these puppets I would like to combine them with the poems of Baudelaire oh, okay. so he's also, also he was inspired by this <laughs> and what what has. Baudelaire to do with frogs, <laughs> but, um, uh, but that came later because there are poems where frogs are entering the uh, um, uh, 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 the, the, the take over the world. That's one <laughs> picture that there are frogs eating you. But that comes much much later. The what I meant. They, they, so these these puppet teach all of us something, and that also is in the in the show in, in the performance. Um, still, that I just uh, that I can f just follow the puppet, so I can listen with the puppet, and I can look more listening with the puppet, and just follow. So I have no I have no idea every evening what he will do. <laughs> there's a plan, and there are some <laughs> things, but it's always in a different way, and I have to follow. And that then so then it's a good puppet for me if I don't control it. Mm. Yeah. Okay. That's a very interesting insight. And so now we have a pop quiz because I used to teach at Georgia Tech. Uh, my job was to uh, help the engineers communicate what they were building to the lay audience. <laughs> and so the pop quiz is I'm going to give you six simple machines because all mechanisms are based on one or more of the six simple machines. And I'm going to ask you, have you, how have you applied any one of the six simple machines in a mechanism that you've built? OK, so um, I'm going to give this to everyone so it's not a quiz where you have to pull this out of your head from sixth grade or wherever you first heard <laughs> it. But the six simple machines are a pulley. Okay, everybody that's dealing with marionettes, you're working with that. A lever. Give up a lever. An inclined plane. A screw. A wheel, an axle, and a wedge. I believe I have a couple designs to incorporate all of those. Okay. <laughs> except every one except the wedge. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, which one's it's, the it's a It's a spider marionette puppet. Okay. Are there any images that you sent me that might demonstrate that? No. No. Nope. You just have to believe me. Okay. <laughs> I just want to say it. I plead the fifth. Oh, no, 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 no. I had to. No. I just had to do that. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. But I, I remember your installation at the Center for Puppetry Arts, mm -hmm. and it was interactive, and there were all these cool dinosaurs and robots that the public could actually manipulate. And if I remember correctly, there were levers mm -hmm. that the public could push, and they were attached to strings, which were essentially pulleys mm. that made the puppets move in the way that you wanted them to move. Hmm. Yeah, so you're using it. <laughs> you didn't have to plead the fit. OK, how about you all? <laughs> we use a lot of wheels. We got a lot of uh, like yeah. cycles, loops. We have a, I think there's an image of a, we have a tiny little record player that we use to build an image that uh, there's like a camera, and you basically see at the top of a spinning record player. Uh, I think it's the last one. Oh, the slideshow didn't oh, seem to update oh, from when okay. I edited it. Well, you, you have to believe me. <laughs> Once more to see the show. <laughs> or come see the show. Uh, yeah. Um, but also uh, crankies. I was thinking yeah, we have a lot of the music boxes are cranky, and we also have 
a, like an internal cranky, so I think that'd be an axle wheel mm-hmm. yeah. mechanism, and a, I guess a pulley because we have a drive belt on our, <coughs> uh, right, on yeah. our cranky. Right. So mm-hmm. could get two in one. Yeah. Uh, like um, you crank the thing in the image. Uh, there is a cranky on ah, the slide show. The cranky is. I think the next ah, one down. Yeah, oh, there's that one too. So that's another yeah. axle and wheel slideshow. And then this has a ribbon of an image and then a mask over it as well. But that's the mechanism of the, the little hand cranky. And, like it, and it works for an endless loop. I'm trying to miniaturize the you know, single direction loop yeah. uh, into one. It's harder to gather paper. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's harder, but I'm sure we could do it. But I guess that's kind of what the other one was. OK. All right. What is, what is pulley? A pulley. Pulley? What is, is it? Uh, okay. OK. So there's a yeah, mechanism okay. at the top. The string runs through. Yeah. And basically, a pulley, you pull down to lift something up. Oh. I, 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 I ah, OK. Yeah, I, I, I have something here. OK, yeah. great. <laughs> <laughs> I think the, it is, uh, this is the public one topic. It's here. Pulley. Yeah, no, <laughs> they have a pulley here. Yeah. 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 So yeah. Yes. You have your thumb on a lever? Yeah, so I can, I, 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 I lift that up oh, and this cool. is going down nice. because this is going up there. That's a pulley. <laughs> oh. uh, can you turn the other way so they can see? You want to see it? Let me turn it. They can't see it from this. So from ah, they okay, can't so see what we see. Yeah. So yeah. If, if I, if I pu- pu- push yeah. up this yeah. one up there, and this is going up and this is going down. Ah, cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's a pulley. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Yes. Okay. yes. Thank you for Thank showing you. that. Thank you. And wouldn't the slide mechanism count as an inclined plane, maybe? Maybe, yeah. 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 One yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the inclined plane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's good. It's two okay. for one. Two for one. Great. So we could play with that more maybe in the Q&A. But um, the next one I'm going to ask you is a little bit about your training um, and how you develop the skill of building these mechanisms. Mm. Uh, No formal training for me, a lifelong artist. When I decided to jump into this uh, insane world of puppetry, I intentionally isolated myself from the rest of you so I can develop my own style and didn't get any influence from, the influence from anyone. Um, yeah, that, and I think it worked because everyone says I've never seen anything like that. <laughs> and that's the number one quote I think that an artist wants to hear. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah. But just now you also mentioned something about the ancestors. Yes. Um, as far as my building process, I think when I started building, you know, it's all, I'm all trial and error. So of course, when you first start, I say I was like a 50 percentile success rate where I would think of something and it would work. Now, 20 years later, I think 95% I'll think of a concept and apply it and it worked. So now I'm like 5% mistake, 95% success now. Just, <laughs> just, not just not because I'm a genius or anything, I just made millions of mistakes and I paid attention to every one <laughs> and knew not to do it again. So. You are a genius. Thank you. <laughs> That's my son. You're a genius too, son. Yes. <laughs> uh, I'm not. Uh, this is my first puppet show. This is my first time performing, even. I'm mostly. Uh, <laughs> it feels good. It does. It does feel good. I'm, I'm, and I think that a lot of people who come to it and are also surprised by how good it feels or even how good it is to watch, uh, there's a first time surprise. So I'm having a first time surprise. It's great. Um, my background is as a lighting and scenic designer for. Um, traditionally for theater. I like a lot of storefront theater. That's what I uh, grew up doing here in Chicago. And um, uh, I, I came to this by um, uh, starting in, in sort of a toy theater idea. And even that cranky uh, mechanism started as like a little uh, proscenium stage. That's where it was. That was just a cyclorama on the background with some miniature figures. And then once we started putting things in boxes, it felt like 
oh, what else can we put into a box and how else can things that come out of a box tell a story differently? So um, arrived at this, the, the play that from a different direction, mostly from a design point of view. Uh, I always, I've always made things. Uh, I studied acting in college. I was really frustrated with the, the role of the performer in the creative room. Um, and so I started, after college, I started a company and we started doing uh, outdoor work, public uh, spectacle work. Uh, and so immediately started making puppets and large masks. Uh, and then I got, I had the fortune to work with Blair for years and uh, really enjoyed the kind of process of you know, co collaboratively, like building images, bringing puppets into the room, seeing what they wanted to do, and I think, um, yeah. So that's that's my journey. It's, I like being in a room with stuff and saying, what kind of, how can we tell a story? Great. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I start. I I think I always did it. That's what my parents say. <laughs> so I started in in kindergarten to build puppets and always built stages and uh, made theater with that for, for my friends. Um, very alone, it was before the internet and <laughs> I didn't know that there are other people doing that, so that maybe he's stupid, he's playing with puppets. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 and um, uh, then I, because they always came into our city, the, 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 the theater Spebu and Hovinek, it's a puppet, uh, string puppets from Prague. And so I, uh, that, oh, they, are, they are also played for adults in the evening. And uh, very, uh, yes, so I was, had a huge influence of, of them. And the only idea I had when I, when I have the possibility, I go there to, 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 to work with them. Yeah, <laughs> because it was the only people I knew. And uh, then slowly it started that I, get knew the, the, the people in Stuttgart around Albrecht Rosa, the, the, the puppeteer. Um, and first I went to, to Prague to, to, to be an elève, like a, um, a student. Stu stu mm, what is it? It's uh, like an internship. Okay. Uh, and it was uh, uh, beautiful to, to, to work in a, in a, as a young, young to, to, to see how they do it and how it works. And then I went to study in the in the Stuttgart school, and that was my that's my my, my mm -hmm. training, yeah, uh, yeah. So I, I work every day <laughs> in the workshop to, to build something what I don't know in the morning. <laughs> so I try to do that every day, mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, the building is happening every day. Sometimes nothing happens, mm -hmm. but sometimes something happens. And um, yeah, training to perform and uh, uh, to res uh, make research and uh, rehearsals every day. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So for those of you in the audience, um, I think an important takeaway here is that you do not have to have a specialized training to enter into puppetry and to create amazing things. It's just the persistence of working at it day after day after day. But that said, I also want to signal that puppeteers, because they are always solving creative problems, um, do produce some incredible feats of engineering. Some of them are patentable, <laughs> like the Waldo that Jim Henson developed. The Waldo is a remote control device which uh, uses the same technique of the puppeteer's hand inside the Muppet oh. with, um, uh, well, I think it's radio-controlled sensors that transmit those movements to a puppet that is not touching the puppeteer wow. at all. And so that's a technology that goes back into the 80s. So puppeteers are creating amazing things all the time. <laughs> Some of you might be doing patentable stuff, <laughs> so, so you should keep records of what you're doing in case it has to be argued in court at some point. <laughs> okay, so um, then my next question is, what design problem are you still trying to solve? 
wet one is just like, oh, I can't get this to work. As of now, I don't have any. I figured everything out. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Not Good sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, just in terms of the show, I guess w there's um, 55 cities in the book that we've adapted, and we have about 19. Of, we have 19 of those cities, so there's more cities in there that appeal to to us, and um, we've talked about taking them into some wild places. And I think one of them uh, would be a globe, and just sort of an inter a, a globe that we can interact with, but that also, I think, would want to come out of a box, <laughs> or somehow, we don't know yet, but just that the, the sphere shape is, is a challenge, I think, that I can immediately think of. Yeah, I think almost every piece in our show, in my mind, I'm like, oh, what could we, like, we get off stage and we're like, oh, you know what, the seam of the paper is the problem, maybe we need a lot, you know, so I, I think we're kind of in constant discussion of like, oh, actually, another engineering problem is we don't have backups of these puppets, so oh, yes. we're in the process of <laughs> making a second for each puppet, because the problem is if one of them crapped out, which they do, uh, we'd be stuck, so... Um, so we're also in the process of being like, what are the ones that are going to be the hardest to remake? That's that's big in our mind, just the life of the show. Yeah. No, I don't. I really don't know what. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> uh, uh, it, for me, it's always a fight with material ah, in the workshop. Yes. So um, uh, sometimes it works and it, it, it fits together this new material, and but in the end, I would I, I would. Uh, it's also a research of the invisible puppet. Mm. <laughs> what do you? What do I really need? And um, then it would be great to get uh, 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 rid, uh, get rid, get rid, rid of the of this material and stuff that we carrying all. all oh. the time. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm 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 a little bit uh, benighted. What is this? I'm a little bit jealous about musicians. They have their instruments, but, but the, the art, what comes out, is invisible. <laughs> you can only can hear it. So I, I, I'm, I'm always looking for what is between the puppets and to make that bigger mm. so that we can I, all see it. I do have a challenge. I <laughs> was at a performance at a library, and an uh, audience member was blind. Mm -hmm. And they said, can you find a way for me to enjoy the show. Yes. So yes, I do have a problem. I want to make a, <laughs> show, a puppet show for yes. the blind. Yes. Mm -hmm. Maybe yeah. some texture or sensory type of thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm not thinking about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a great problem. OK, so thank, problem. Yeah. thank you, Michael, <laughs> for bringing um, the question of materials into the conversation, because um, your mechanism is intricately connected to the materials in which you choose to execute it. And a lot of our fails are the material. It's not the mechanism, but that um, the material can't do what we're asking it to do. It take, it's too much stress, or um, it weighs too much, and it works perfectly, but we can't get through a performance with something that's that heavy. Um, so if you would all talk for a minute about um, a situation where the affordances of the material either facilitated or frustrated your design. I was uh, speaking to him earlier. I was uh, commissioned to build a fireproof uh, puppet for a show called Random Acts of Flyness on HBO. <laughs> so the director, he you know scheduled a Zoom call. So. We don't know how he said, can you make a fireproof puppet? Because he wanted a, a creature to crawl out of a, a campfire. So I was like, sure, no problem. <laughs> I got off the Zoom calls like, how am I going to make <laughs> so, a puppet? So like, you know, problem solving. So he actually put me in touch with his, um, his uh, effects team. And the, uh, the guy that I spoke with, he said, there's this material called panther cloth where it's probably like an eighth of an inch thick, and this is the material that uh, stuntmen use when they get set on fire and run. 
<laughs> and it, it's um, like an eighth of an inch thick, which is really, is a he really heavy uh, fabric. And it was really hard to work with because it was, it was so uh, dense. But it withstood 2,000 degrees. So I laid it, my son's good, I can tell you, I, we laid it on our hand, I put a mini torch against it and it dispersed the heat. So I had to figure out how to turn that material into a marionette. So I just did a wood structure and I just wrapped and stapled the stuff to it, to it covered the whole thing. <laughs> and they burned it like 10 times before it actually caught on the inside and it fell apart. So that, that it took, the first uh, frame I built for it was um, copper, cause I was like, you know, metal but the metal, I couldn't find a good connector that wouldn't burn. So I just was like, I'll just use the wood and uh, send it up there, up to New York with a prayer. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it works. <laughs> That's great. That's a fascinating story. Yeah. Yes. A material frustration? If, or, if, or, or if, you know, a success, if, if that's more satisfying to talk about. I mean, I think, I think in terms of what you were just saying about it's the material and not the device, uh, the the music box is a finicky uh, thing in that the the way it's currently printed it's in multiple sections so it has seams the seams uh, cause like a gumming of the works inside the device um, it's also uh, the one strip we're using right now which is a stock of paper that I still have plenty of I've printed it multiple times and the only time it's ever worked is the one strip that we're using <laughs> all of the backups and and if you've ever made these things you have to punch out every single hole so I've, I've punched thousands and thousands of holes on so many different strips and each strip just seems to not have uh, the right clearance or the right whatever or maybe just not being fed right but this one that works does. <laughs> so we hope it stays in perpetuity. <laughs> so working on that spare. <laughs> we had a thing happen this week where, so uh, we have an image, uh, it's in there somewhere. Oh, it's the next one actually. It says okay. Balkus on top of the ladder. And so uh, it has like a, a foam insert where the whole, it, the thing is built on telescoping legs and by inserting the ladder it holds. And it's all based on this little foam base that held it beautifully for a year and a half. Oh. And then the foam just starts to wear away, wear away. And it's like, do we take the thing apart? Do we put a new foam thing in? And we wanted to fix the image for this run. And we were eating the little baby bell cheese things that are wrapped in the wax. And I'm like, no, I think I, I, think I have an idea. So I, I created a bunch of little wax panels. And so now every show we put the little wax panel and it holds it's it's couldn't be it's better than the foam was you know it, it, just, it adds to our reset which is also infinite but uh, we, we also have um little bottles and a cork dried and broke and we had no cork for this little bottle it was hard enough to find the one that fit tightly uh and it has to seal the liquid and the same baby bell cheese wax uh, played, uh, so we're using cheese we're going through like two cheeses a show i mean it's, it's wild brought to you by baby bell <laughs> yes yeah so uh, the question is what i uh, what kind of material i hate or what the problems are with if, yeah if you want to talk about that <laughs> <laughs> in in the work, I always have to choose a material that I fall in love with. And so even if 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 it gives even if it gives me some uh, uh, strong things to do, I remember one we did a Frankenstein show and the theme of wax came up. So mm -hmm. I started to do to work with hot wa wax on stage and mm -hmm. to build the puppets on stage out of this hot wax. Mm -hmm. Also, fire came in then, and then the theaters. They get fried. <laughs> <in front. laughs> you have hot, you have the burning wax on stage. Then you need water for that to cool that down. But it's interesting. I'm fighting then with the more with the with the theaters, with the security of the theaters. They have an interesting material, but they are not. They don't allow, allow it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and in, in, in Germany, we have we have. Uh, so I think we uh, theater will be dead. When they, uh, when they, uh, the puppet theater will be will be dead if we have to follow all these rules <laughs> for <laughs> materials. So for, for the Frankenstein, we had also paper on stage, so fire 
water, <laughs> everything. <laughs> and uh, um, uh, then the one theater said we can buy some paper what is, what is fireproof, what <laughs> is allowed in the theater, but it's incredibly expensive, a piece of that. It's hundreds of euros, <laughs> uh, but we needed, we needed the whole stage full of that. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's an interesting fight going on. I think the, all the puppet theater festival will be closed down oh. if, if, the, if the fire engines come in. And, and <laughs> is, this really, is this really fireproof, this material? And if it's not, you have... Uh, so that would be interesting ones to... Uh, so we need the... We need the government to, to, to save the, the puppet theatre. <laughs> <laughs> all, the, all our puppets will go <laughs> off stage. <laughs> we always say, yes, yes, it's water, it's of fire. Of course. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> of course. All of this paper. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that's what I'm fi fighting with. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Okay, that, that's, a, that's a, a wonderful story. Um, <laughs> okay. So um, let, let's come back to the idea of mechanisms and movement. And so um, what is a puppet that's not yours that you are just in awe of the way it moves? I seen online they, um, the 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 th story of Pi, mm -hmm. that tiger. Yeah. Yes, that's all I'll say. <laughs> I don't have uh, a sufficient background yet to to comment on this one. Okay. <laughs> the first one that came to mind is the. Um, there was a production in Chicago of uh, Old Man and Sea, Salal, the worst kind of unlucky, uh, and uh, humans operating one life-size wooden uh, uh, puppet, and uh, built by Jesse Mooney Bullock, uh, mm. and uh, it it sat around the Red Moon Studio for years and years, and in a chair you felt like you were in a room with somebody, like it just it lived, it just breathed, and uh, had a if I remember, it had a light chamber in the top of its head that caught stage light, so its eyes would like have life. You know, they they would glow blue and uh, just move move beautifully. But yeah, beautiful puppet. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a really hard question to choose <laughs> one. Okay, uh, it's, uh, it's all the puppets where where colleagues from from us uh, where they really the puppets can talk to to, to our souls. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, for me there are, I maybe I say have to say two then nobody can there's one the, the puppets of uh, Neville Trenter the who plays with the um, uh, there uh, he had he had a, he had beautiful puppets uh, uh, all this technique and how he was connected to uh, to them and uh, one uh, the other colleague is uh, Frank Söhle from the from the theater in Tübingen. He had a puppet that was called um, uh, out of the show Rothschild's Geige, and the puppet was Marfa, an old woman, mar marionette, was big like this, and this puppet he was so beautiful, connected to that, and the puppet could be everything. She was telling the whole story. It was an old woman, it was an old man, it was the forest, it was the puppet was everything mm -hmm. in the story. Um, that was really amazing, and this was technically nothing. This puppet. But everything was going through that. Uh, so it's Marfa. For me, it's Marfa from mm -hmm. Frank Sunde. Okay. Yep. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so um, still kind of keeping with that theme. Um, puppets that you've operated. Please talk about a mechanism in a puppet that you've operated that you're just like, sweet. It does what I need it to do, <laughs> and you have just an excellent relationship with that mech in that puppet. Well, I think one of my favorite, um, I call them the good mistakes, is um, th there's a puppet that's touring with uh, Richard Termine's uh, photography show. <coughs> it's a, 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 a raptor, like a, a bird, mm -hmm. and the, uh, the feathers, I, I learned this, uh, 
feather building technique from a workshop that I did at an art school in Durham, North Carolina, where they took a piece of wire and they put two pieces of masking tape together over the wire and then cut into a feather shape. I love that concept, so I use that. And the, 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 the bird hangs from my chest and I control the wings with my hands. And what I did was, there's a, a the neck has like a uh, like a tentacle neck to it where the strings run and you pull it back and forth. It, the the, uh, the head lifts up and it looks back and forth while it's flying. The sh I have a fishing line connected to the head on both sides, running through the body and out to the string. And you you can't see it, but when I pull the wing back. It's a, a pulley for the head, and people can't see how it moves. And I was like, yes, this is one of my favorite uh, mechs. Because, uh, you know, it was a good mistake thing where I didn't know it was going to work out that way. I just tried it, and it, it worked. So it flaps, and it looks around at the same time. And people, how's the head moving? So, <laughs> magic of puppetry. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Oh, I don't know. All I can think of is fights. <laughs> <laughs> I need a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I will. Oh. The fights with the technique. Oh. F uh, fights with the object. Yeah, I don't know. It sounds so negative. I don't feel negative about it. I love them, but like, I can't. I'm totally. All I can think of is like wearing the, a big head over me where my whole neck is moving the thing. And it's like, it for the audience, the experience is like, it's painful inside, but. <laughs> I can only think of fights, that's all. Yeah. <laughs> I, I rem also remember that Charlotte starts now to say very often, stop, stop with these techniques. It always breaks one, ten minutes before the audience comes in, and uh, then you have the big trouble, so better uh, don't do it anymore. So especially when it's digital, then it gets really yeah. interesting. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I just want to show you this. Uh, yes. uh, <laughs> I hope it works now. <laughs> but it also was interesting with this puppet because it was also not planned. But then by the by the rehearsals, it came out. It would be nice if the puppet can do that. And so um, in the rehearsals came out. It would be nice if it moves. If it can move the mouth, it would be great. And then that the uh, here that the, the tongue. Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh. Oh. That's all about the tone. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's, it's a traditional trick marionette, yeah? So it's, um, nothing new. But um, in the rehearsal, the, 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 this was a, the tongue with language that's important. So the, the, the puppet who doesn't speak has a tongue. And it's, 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 um, it's also it's completely another material. Uh, come out. It's um, <laughs> latex. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Oh. yeah. So it's not something like this. I was looking for for material what uh. what could be wet <laughs> so or something. Yeah. 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 I, so I needed bad. a contrast <laughs> in the in the puppet for that. That's yeah. That's a mechanism. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Now that's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> So since the topic of fights with the <laughs> material and the mechanisms came out, um, have you had occasion to modify a design for yourself or for another puppeteer who physically couldn't do what you needed to do to operate the mechanism in the puppet? Go, go back to the... Um the this, this spider marionette that I have. When I first built it, what I, what I do, I build the puppet and then I walk away and I come back to figure what makes it needs to move the way I want it to move. It's not on there. But um, yeah, when I first built it, you know, it's eight legs and two, you know, two uh, parts of the body. And I was like, yeah, I'll just do a marionette. And that was a train wreck. I couldn't even hang it. I, I just divorced marionettes altogether. I was so frustrated for a while. But um, actually threw it in the corner for like a year. I wouldn't even touch it until I came up with a concept. Then I was watching um, some Czech style marionettes where the steel rod goes through and that makes it stable. And they just use the strings for the, the um, limbs. 
So it's like, hmm. So I went back to the spider and I put two steel rods in the, the front and the abdomen. And the front rod controlled the front first four legs and the back the last four legs. And I, I rigged it where they moved opposite of each other at the same time, like a spider. So I was like, yes, victory. So that worked for two years. And I was like, I'm not satisfied with this anymore. So I got an idea. I was like, I can collapse it and make it simpler. So now I just have one rod and I have a, a, a piece of wood going across and it's in the middle. And now I just move it up and down like a, a seesaw and the front moves it. And it, it's a lever. It's a lever. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lever. So that, that that happened like a year ago. So I'm happy with it for now until I figure out a way to do it without any UMX. Because my uh, whole concept of approaching the movement is to have the most movement with the least amount of controls. Mm -hmm. So if you see my work, it'll be one controller, but it'll like I have this um, a sea serpent. It's two controls front and back. When I lift the front control up on the on the lever, the fins raise up and the head. Uh, pops up when I put it down the fins drop and the head drops but the mouth opens so it's just like little subtle movements that have and it has a tongue too all my puppets have tongues <laughs> it doesn't well, drop out though <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, uh, the uh, I did repairs on um, like a mid, mid run of the house theaters nutcracker and inherited these rats that have had many lives. You've probably seen a version of them uh, this month. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but when I inherited them, uh, the so first of all, wait, always wait. Every puppeteer that's ever, I feel like people are always like, can you make it lighter? And so gutting puppets, done a lot of gutting and, or subbing a material for a lighter material. These, one of the things was make them lighter, but also they were like, they don't move quite right, and it, the fulcrum was in the wrong place. So we did, I did a lot of like assessing weight and trying to find the midpoint, mm -hmm. and then moving the fulcrum. And then I, I was like, okay, lighter, and I went inside, and it was full of rocks. It was literally <laughs> full of rocks <laughs> that they had offset the wrong fulcrum point by just loading it with literally rocks. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, yeah, so we cleared out all the rocks and there. <laughs> Way better. Did you keep any of the rocks as a Oh, God, I should have. No. I don't know where those rocks are. Okay. Yes. <laughs> That's great. And so just, just to remember that a fulcrum is the point that the lever rotates around. We're talking lever. Yeah, we're talking about it. <laughs> Six simple machines. <laughs> yes. I remember one, one show that was this, a seagull by the Chekhov yeah. thing. And uh, the seagull, and the seagull was, we said, the seagull's always shitting on you. So it would be nice if, if, if there's always coming from the ceiling to, on the puppets and on the puppeteers. To get, um, <laughs> But a little bit by accident, so no, not. <laughs> <laughs> and it gets. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and, and I worked very long uh, with machines to put a, a razor, sh sh how do you show the uh, shaving cream? Sh shaving cream into machines that. <laughs> then it was in the theater was too hot, and it was after half an hour was melt, and it, ah, it was really. Uh, um, and the puppeteers were always down and looking, is something coming or nothing coming? <laughs> <laughs> it was really, it, uh, so it didn't, it, ne it ne not really worked. And then, then years later, I found this very simple uh, foam soap where you push and then the foam <laughs> comes out. <laughs> you push and <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, So um, I was, uh, that, that's, that's it, you only have to <laughs> uh, and for, I used it then in another show. Uh, uh, a colleague, the Stefan Wenzel, maybe he can perform that in this. In this, you ask for some little scenes. <laughs> maybe you will see this little machine. Uh, <laughs> that was so. Sometimes you find uh, then in, yeah. a, in, a, in, a, in a normal shop yeah. uh, a beautiful 
<laughs> little machine. Yeah, that's it. That's it. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Good. So I, I, we had interjection from the audience. That's great. You all are a wonderful audience. And to me, that's a signal that people have questions. And also, unfortunately, we're going to use, lose um, Jigetto in a few minutes. So I want to make sure that if anyone has questions for Jigetto, you get to ask them. So we'll open it back up to the floor. Um, and then we'll see where the conversation goes. I will come to you with the mic. Uh, we are uh, live streaming and recording this, so we want to make sure that the um, virtual audience. Oh, Blair has the mics. Great. I could stay here. <laughs> okay. So the first question was right there. Um, I was just wondering if you had, um, with the pyrotechnic or the um, the fire one that you mm -hmm. did, um, if there was, if you looked into uh, nichrome wire for um, high temperature wire, it's like for kiln firing. <coughs> I have not, and I probably won't be revisiting the again. <laughs> if she were here a year and a half ago, that would have been awesome info. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's one and done. <laughs> um, what's your favorite material to prototype with? Uh, cardboard. And then I can transfer it to wood because it's basically wood. <laughs> but yeah, if I uh, have something I need to you know, physically see what it does, I just grab a piece of cardboard, fold it and cut it, and it's very malleable and cheap. It's basically free because my wife loves Amazon. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I have lots of boxes at the house I can use. <laughs> Good. Is it okay if we pass that question down the line? Yeah, I'm cardboard too. Uh, <laughs> or, pa or paper, yeah. <laughs> Uh, this, is, this, is the, uh, this is a mixture between some, some, uh, some uh, plaster and clay and uh, dust from the Hoover and <laughs> water, different kinds of glues, different kind of glues. And I mix that together, and every day something else comes out. And it's then, then there's, a, there's something. Um, wet and dry in that then because it gets dry and ca can take it off i i still love that dialogue with that and it's, uh, yeah that's my favorite okay i have a tool pitch if anybody for sure. cardboard lovers out there uh it's a there's a kickstarter right now for an object that's essentially a cardboard table saw so it has a little nib and you can run it for precision cutting and then it can it gathers all of the uh, cut remnants so you can get like detail cardboard cuts great for prototyping so nice. Kickstart right now. I can't. I can't. <laughs> hang out after. I'll, 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 yeah. I'll, uh, let's, let's look it up afterward. Hang out. Yeah. Let's look it up now. <laughs> when you have a puppet that requires multiple puppeteers to operate, like, how do you work that out in a rehearsal setting? with rehearsal <laughs> yes uh, but um, especially if it's a like a person I, I uh, switch positions and we'll even do it mid-show where one person will hold the puppet and then one person works hands and the third person works feet if it takes three people but I think the more the merrier where you get <clears throat> that that fluidity where if everything is moved at the same time the more movement the more realistic it is so that's yeah, my answer to that. Just lots of rehearsal. Uh, uh, I have your puppeteers who are working together, have all of them try the different positions and see what person is best on that puppet. Because with my two sons, my, uh, my oldest son, he's the strong one, so he holds the puppets. And me and my son, uh, Taryn, we switch uh, doing hands and feet. I think he's better on the feet making it walk and run. So we, that's his uh, assignment in, the, in uh, the puppet shows. I think we um, have several that we've discovered work best as a two-person um, because of the show and, and because of the way it works. But I, it makes me think that like the operators are just the apex mechanisms. Like we just, It's about trying to find out how the machine works and we're just the 
other moving parts of like where does this moving part have to stand or be at or operate and that's so then we just become part of the machine that's my favorite kind of work I love that and I feel like switching perspectives and taking breaks right like you know is this question going to how you work in an ensemble together with other people? Is this? It's mostly just like if you, ha sorry. It's mostly just like if you had a bunch of people, like how would you get it to a point where they were fluidly operating the same puppet? Yeah, that's a, also, for me it's a complex que question always. It's uh, to work with more people together and um, my my experience is that what I what I like uh, to find out from every person who is in the group to find what is uh, is speciality and that can be very different and that's my so that can be a, somebody is more more working with objects and other better with a, a, a glove puppet and other with materials other yeah that's so different like like we like. Also, like musicians who choose different instruments, and that, that's my impression. Also, the, in the in the puppet theater, people, and then to find a material or a kind of a puppet where everybody can connect to, uh, and if if you if you but I, if you go on this on this trip, you don't know what will come, what kind of puppet will come out in the end, because it's a it's a it's a mixture be between different aesthetic things. <laughs> Uh, and um, then, from for me, you, you get a nice result. It's not the aesthetic thing then, but you see that different people working together on one idea or on one story. So I know there's there's this classical tradition of uh, of playing one puppet together, but where's the puppet coming from? Who built the puppet? <laughs> that you don't have this uh, so much these these questions. So, uh, if so, that's what comes into my mind by this question: that <coughs> working together on one thing. Yeah. Okay. I'm probably supposed to say something about breath too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, th I think there's, there's like uh, there there's there's building the images and hitting the images and hitting the marks, and then there's also like the improvisational like learning the flow and the rhythm and the way the thing wants to move in a more improvisational, just like, how does it just like do whatever, you know? But I also feel like knowing those marks and those images and, and hitting that, it depends on the piece, of course, but like, I, I also think about like, build the image, then what's the next image, then what's the next image, and I, locking that into the body also, I think, is a, always a priority for me. I'm gonna jump in, uh, oh, go ahead. Oh, and just on what you sort of threw at the very end before, uh, taking breaks and new perspectives, I think, deserves a little bit more than, than that. I think that that exact thing of uh, it, it, when you start with something, you seem to get, it's easy to get locked into, I built the puppet, and so I'm, this is how I designed it to work, and this, that. <clears throat> and then having someone else who didn't build the puppet come in and have a whole other uh uh, perspective on it is really is really useful um, to try to take a break to unlock any sort of expectation of how it's supposed to work in order to try something new and, and that's useful. That's exactly the point I was coming to. I've, I've have a um, background in special ed educate special education special ed education is that two educations? <laughs> but anyway, um, I've I've worked with children and I've do a lot of you know young people performances. And I have a show titled Jigetto's Workshop where I invite the children up and they can work the puppets and I'm always paying attention because it's a one time little adorable girl. She was like four years old. So I handed her a puppet. I said, well, how would you work? And she said, oh, you mean like this? And the way she controlled it was the exact opposite of how I did it and it worked better. <laughs> and I'm like, thank you for that. So now I'm always, <laughs> I'm quick to hand the kid a puppet just to see like, I won't, even sh I won't even show them how to do it. I say, how would you figure out how to work this? And I like to see their brain work and the way they move things. I'm always learning from everyone who touches the puppet. So that's the same concept where it all yeah. you know, comes back around. That's great. So um, I just want to take a moment to explore this because we're all cardboard <laughs> fans in here. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so we need to know about this thing. <laughs> 
Um, I think we may not get the sound. Um, so this is probably the weirdest Yeah, I'm just going to uh, cut yeah. the sound, <laughs> but we can at least see what it, this is the ad. <laughs> Go away. Okay. So we, we have an idea of, we have an idea of what it does. And um, let me go back over here. It's on Inventable. And it looks like you can pre order one. Inventable. How much? Oh yeah. That's important too. Hundred and eighty nine dollars. <laughs> Estimated May 2024 <laughs> delivery. Yeah. Right. It won't be May, too. You know it. Kickstarter. Yeah. Who's been there? It's going to be 2025. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> so that, that was a nice interlude. We have more questions? Yes, please. And How many of you um, use interior lighting and LED lights in your puppets, mm -hmm. and how have you seen that or, or used the advancing technology to increase? Uh, the beauty and marvel of the puppets through lighting. Yeah, I tried the internal lighting thing because I have a science fiction puppet show with robots in it, and it's too many cues. I have to worry about puppeteering and placement, and then I would forget to turn the lights on for the eyes, and I was like, you know what? I can't do this. <laughs> the bad, the batteries were, you know, and then, well, then, then you know, all the uh, the bike. Uh, bicycle lights, they had the USB charger now, which is a better thing, but then I wouldn't charge it before the show. <laughs> so I, I kind of pulled away from that, but I just let the uh, light people at the theaters, you know, make beautify my puppets. I, I gave up on the lighting. <laughs> I think that um, the, the exactly that, the, the intersections of um, durability of the material, uh, the use of batteries or not, Cueing it, is it a, something that's on the puppet or, or the box in our case, or is it something that someone else can control? I think I, there's so much potential. I mean, we have some, uh, we use LED uh, strips, we use LED like but, uh, very cheap ones, and it's maybe worth upgrading to, to get those, but then you always will run into the battery problem, and then it becomes a weight problem if it really needs to be a long, you know, so it, it has a lot of. Uh, potential and I, I think there's some great stuff that, that we found uh, that, that works really well for us and yeah yeah is this I, one of your um, oh. circuits and this is so this is a fun one this was uh, attempting to be yes so this is uh, a single LED uh, diodes that just um, light from behind a postcard so in front of the postcard you know the image is lit up in these windows and everything and then um, was playing with this uh, stuff it's just um, it's just copper tape and so um, you need a couple layers of it to make connectivity really good I've, I've made like three or four iterations of this by now 
and um, the one we have works well, I think. And um, it's, this was a fun thing to try to merge paper tech with electricity. That's why I specifically used this and didn't really go for wire uh, on it because it's a postcard and trying to honor the medium. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. So. I, 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 <laughs> Bye, Bye Cherish. Thank you. Appreciate it. I find it also interesting with these lights in puppets. So if you, uh, I, I have one puppet where it's now very old, 20 years old. Now there are the old um, glass uh, uh, little lamps inside. And you have a normal control, uh, uh, a piezo to make it. It's not so a piezo, what is it called? Just a very simple, uh, even not a dimmer, it's a, it's a Poti, yeah? Poti meter. Yes, one poti motor, boop, 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 and you turn it and it goes on and off. Very, very simple. And so it, because it's 20 years old, <laughs> I always get re remembered by that. And then now with the LED things, you, so what I need for that is the, it's to control or to, to control it in a very nice way. You need a little computer or a Raspberry Pi to, to, to make it yeah. work. So um, my experience with, with, with that is that if you need something really um, uh, independent, where you are not touched to then the LED and the Raspberry Pis and all this technique is beautiful. It's also where you need a, a cold, for me it's a cold um, uh, uh, information or so something spooky or, uh, yeah, from another star, so not human. Uh, then I have, I have, for me, I have get some nice results. Uh, and on stage with this old technique, I, I'm very much connected to that. So I, I immediately I, and I feel I'm, I'm in that. Uh, so this has, there are two different things what, 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 you, what you would like to do. So that's not something better or not. <laughs> something yeah. something completely different and I'm, I'm working a lot on at the moment at this um, digital world and the analog world and the puppeteer yeah has to <laughs> connect that in a way uh, but it's mm -hmm. also different worlds for my feeling mm -hmm. yeah, it's something completely other, other things yeah, yeah. yes mm. thank you so for anybody that wants to play with paper circuits and does not want to shell out for copper tape because it's expensive, you can use aluminum foil. It has just enough connectivity for you to light up your circuit. There's also a paint, a conductive paint, yeah. uh, and that's a really fun. There's a kit, but you can also just get it, and you can like you can screen print with it. You can. It's incredible, incredible material. And this actual uh, device did come from a kit, exactly that. There's a lot of really great educational kits that come with just a few diodes, some copper tape, and a few other things about how to make one. Um, and I, yeah, I haven't found it terrible. I, I guess I found it pretty cheap by the foot. But <laughs> And the adhesive part of the tape is the really uh, uh, clutch thing as well. Mm -hmm. I enjoy it. It's yeah. delicate. <laughs> Very delicate. It rips yes. so easily. Yes. Hi. Uh, do you have any examples of puppets that you've built with a mechanism that then once you started working with it, you either stopped using the mechanism or you, you took it out entirely? A tech that didn't work? Yeah, like, like <laughs> working on a mech and then deciding ultimately, oh, this is too frustrating or it, it's unnecessary. Yeah. Uh, al always. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's, oh, you, 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 uh, I start with an idea of a technique and it never works in that way that, that I thought it would. Mm -hmm. I do, don't remember really. But th something else comes out. So, um, yeah. And sometimes I, it comes back. Yeah, or, you know, years uh, later. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. right, right. <laughs> you know. Sometimes it's unnecessary, but then sometimes it's like, like we cut a, a, a moment, you know, we're limited hands, we're always like, like oh, we've got a hand for this, there's a support another image, but we have the, a, like a tiny uh, slide projector that, that uh, Matt built uh, like gobo textures on 
to like to hit a moment of language and combined with like there's not quite time in the image and also it wasn't the image wasn't hitting and uh, the auto light balance wasn't playing along we kind of cut it but then yesterday we were like actually if we built in a little like tiny cycle like that like emerged then it might play so it might come back in so there is this kind of like sometimes you're like oh we didn't need that and other times like we, we, we should get that it'd be nice to get it uh, and that goes back to what you just said too about trying to like I think keeping the image is the objective like the image is oh we want this thing the text the text says uh, there's this shaft of sunlight it talks about the foliage it talks about shadows that seems important to us and it didn't work the one way and then you know but keep trying to find uh, continuing to try to find the image is what then leads to the new solution yeah I would say too I was thinking about there's at least two cities that are made out of paper inside of tins that didn't work for a variety of reasons uh, where like my um, my paper engineering isn't there yet but um, when you're uh, when you think about the Altoid tin it felt to me when I was first designing I was like it's just a book, it's a book mechanism but the actual the way the planes are moving uh, where the, the lid meets the surface of there and the hinge it's actually a much more complicated action and so the paper requires um, uh, some extra folds, some extra material, and then how does that material get out of the way when the lid closes? So coming up with that, this one city that I'm thinking of was uh, ended up being a much bigger headache and frustration, and I never got there, and so it got cut. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, since I see Alex and Olmsted sitting up front, and you pose that question, um, it brought up something that I should have looped in before Tarish left. Earlier we were talking about the invisible puppet and about puppets for people who can't see the visuals, even though the visuals are the center of what we do. And I'm thinking about your show Marooned and the way that you used iconic computer sounds mm. almost as a character itself. And so I'm thinking about what sound contributes even sound is immaterial, and yet what sound contributes to the show, and we have the music, musician for Spleen up here as well, so what does sound contribute to the show? Then that, I guess, is the immaterial materiality. <laughs> <laughs> Do your puppets not make sounds? No, they do, <laughs> absolutely, yeah, and we play with sound, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, in a way, I'm not the right person to answer that because I'm not trying to contribute. I'm trying to do my own part in a show. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I do think that sounds coming from puppets or material or, or actions on stage can be really wonderful and interesting. And then mm, maybe things also can get together. We have a few shows where we use piezos on something and um, or the, the latest show we did for children. Uh, I do have a violin on stage also, but m mainly the music is coming from things that I do on a table, which has a piezo plus a microphone. So I'm, I'm doing things, um, uh, I'm doing sounds, so children can see where the sound actually comes from, and it's not so much a technical uh, process where nobody, and including myself, knows how it actually works. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, maybe like that. <laughs> we do have sounds. We do. We have, we have the music box. Um, but I was thinking that you've added uh, for one of our cities that um, ends with, you know, at night you can hear a door slam, trying to add that little, not just the motion, but a little sound. Yeah. Uh, which yeah. Is, yeah, that's something. We built the show for being a very, for very small, uh, like initially audiences, 15, 20, and with ideas of how we can support a larger room, but this is the first time we've had, like, so it, our hope is that we could just show up and we could just do it, right? So, and the, suddenly the festival is like, have all the support, which is incredible, but then we're like, what do, what do we use? Um, so we, there's a sound person in the room, and for documentation, we love that in the recording that we're doing, so. Uh, we've got a little mic on stage to capture some of the sounds that are have always been for that 15 or 20 people, but now we're like, oh, a little a little hidden mic would be a, a gem. Um, 
So, and we were playing with like, we have a moment with ice in a glass and things like that. And like, like do we mic that, you know, or, you know or, or is it hitting the room just right? You know, like maybe it's, maybe that sound is already filling the room and it's at the right scale. But once there's a mic on stage, it's hard not to be like, oh, you know. And even then we had earlier talked about some sort of diegetic kind of sound making. And, and I, I was just thinking about your slam and I was like, but I could have a wood block. Uh, uh, and a mallet, you know, and that kind of thing, and that starts to change a bit of the visual texture of the show to to do like live fully yeah. as part of it. But we, you know, that I think there's potential for it, and that'd be a fun addition. Michael is thinking deeply. Do you have examples? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No. I'm thinking of this invisible thing and people who are blind mm -hmm. who can't see that. That's mm -hmm. um, that's the next show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but that's something else. What we, it was what I was thinking. I was thinking about this situation. In, uh, uh, I'm sure it's also happening here in, in in Germany. We have more and more puppet, also puppet theater. In the normal theaters, they do it normally for blind people to make this um, somebody description, description yeah. what yeah. is happening. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, we did it for one show, and it was very interesting. If you go through the show, but it's really visible, yeah. and it's like a dramaturgical uh, work, uh -huh. because you also get the feedback where where shit is happening on the stage. Nothing <laughs> is really happening. <laughs> you, can't, you, can't, you, you can't describe it to, to <laughs> them. If, if, it, if, it, if it has a content, it's easy to say what is happening, what is going on. Mm -hmm. uh, so also it, it comes back. That was I was thinking of. Um, it's a dramaturgical work, mm -hmm. also to, to um, uh, for people. Yes, that's but that's what I was thinking about. The okay, well, thing. thank you, because um, that's a, that's a, a significant contribution. Yes. It just put me in mind of has anyone ever read? I think it's James Thurber's Thirteen Dead Clocks, and there's this. It's a wonderful little book, and uh, there's a line in there that says, "At that moment, something indescribable and unlike anything else in the world ran by." And it's just, which is sort of like what that stage direction probably <laughs> would sound like. Yeah. Great. So Blair, there's a gentleman here with a question. No, he has a hat in the second row. Actually, I was just stole this idea from her, but uh, old time radio was invisible, and uh, sometimes if you've ever listened to the radio of a sportscaster, you really have invisible uh, puppets on a sport field. <laughs> and the, one of the ones that made me think of it most about your invisible was there was a invisible race uh, uh, on a record called Beetle Bomb, and I think oh, yeah. it was, what was that, the That's 1930s or something? Yeah. And, and they would... Yeah they would do what you described and maybe just stealing some ideas from the past would work. <laughs> it gives me one more thought. I did, uh, there's a photographer here in town named Joe Maza. Uh, hopefully you've had the uh, pleasure of meeting him. Uh, but uh, he and I made a show, uh, 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 it was a flea circus, right? And, uh, and the, we, where uh, uh, Dr. Folderall was to prove the existence of love using nothing but these fleas. And, uh, and so it's all about observation and relay, right? This idea of like, you know, he, he witnesses the show and it tries to explain to you the experience that he is, the overwhelming experience of proof of love, which is happening in front of you, but you're unable to see it. So allow him to translate kind of, uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, so yeah, now we have questions popping. So we'll do, take the orange jacket and then the lady there. Is there, I have a question, is there anything in the field of like technology or robotics or something that you want to play with but don't have the tools for or like can't, uh, isn't super accessible say like with like a Raspberry Pi or something? Because of money or like knowledge or either? It does, sometimes those are the same thing in terms of like, it's, those are, this, I'm sorry, let's, let me rephrase, those are the same thing <laughs> uh, in terms of like developer time. I'm asking because my background is in robotic software, uh, and uh, I want to, I don't know, I'm, uh, in, I'm looking for like, what are the things you want to play with so I could like write ways uh, to make it faster or make it more accessible. 
<laughs> Back. All of you. No. You can't clap before I made it. Yeah. It's just speaking specifically to the, the, the Invisible Cities show, because again, I have limited context here. Um, uh, the, the digital thing offers magic. The, the, uh, we, have a, a magi- we have a screen inside of one of our boxes, and I think uh, people really enjoy it and, and find it very, very uh, magical simply because technology being shrunk is kind of amazing. So, I mean, yes, there are, I think there's some cool potential to make something uh, that seems impossible uh, really cool out of that. And, and not just like hand crankies, it's like you can see I'm the machine and I'm, I'm the operator. But the, the technology, the radi- like where's that coming from? I think that is magical and has a lot of potential, but I have no specifics at this time. Yeah, I'd say always, yeah. I, I, a, a thing, I thought of this with the LED question, I think that I'm finding frustrating a lot is that like, I'm really interested in technology that's emerging. A ton of it comes through like weird quasi lifestyle or like, you know, like app supported, right? These like technologies that are being designed to be supported by this device and they're ne- they never play well. They're like, so there's like, our cameras are a great example of like, there's automated, like highly automated. And then there's like deep in the weeds and kind of nothing in, in between. And so when you use a tool that's like a commercial tool, it, it really it like, it's grossness shows up and it's hard to make stuff like I think Philips Hue lights are a great example of like what an incredible tool, but you're like using this app on your phone and like from like you can make you can use it to make magical things, but there's something about the texture of it. It just feels like a lifestyle product, and I feel like it like sh- it shows up that way. And I think that like the same is true of like cameras and all this stuff. Is there's so much technology to get it to match like this lifestyle product world that the way it's you're talking about the, the, that home. Uh, that home lighting system that you can control with your phone. Yeah, totally. yeah. Okay. Yeah, but also comparing it to like the way in which our cameras are all that like have the autofocus and auto light adjust, which really supports a lot of our moments, and then also other moments we're like fighting with it because the automation that's built in is like trying to do the opposite of what we're trying to do, and we can't get in there. Or when we do get in there, we get overwhelmed by the amount of like coding in there, which is like, well, okay, never mind. Or and the, the product <laughs> itself was, I think what you said earlier, the product itself says it can do something, but it is so new itself. It's not great at doing it yet, and not enough people have broken it for the people <laughs> to fix it in the right way. And this is the unfortunate thing about Kickstarters and all new technology is yeah. there needs to be a million people to break it first before they're going to fix it to do what it yeah. can do or find out that it can't actually do what they said it can do. Which is why we can rely on the lever. And the <laughs> <laughs> so we go back to levers, <laughs> and we go back to yeah. these things that we can control. Um, yes. But, yeah. Michael, did you want to speak to that question as well? If I understood it right, mm-hmm. uh, then uh, um, of course there are there are these all these uh, perfumes, the, uh, the temptations. The temptations. <laughs> oh, look there, do that, do that. I, and um, always when I followed that, and I was uh, I, I had to program something, but I don't, uh, but I not I'm not a programmer. Then my whole rhythm of the day or the rehearsal or the the rehearsal period gets smashed. Mm-hmm. So um, uh, I'm really trying to, to work what, what what I can do and uh, what I can 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 come out <coughs> of my fingers at, in that moment, and uh, yeah, uh, to get more more simple. And and, and yes, there are all these things are existing, but. Uh, not, not, not for my generation anymore, <laughs> I think. <laughs> okay, there's a question over by the wall there. Hi, um, kind of going along with the materials, but going the opposite direction. Um, I, I oversee a collection of marionettes that were made from the 30s to the 70s. And when I talk to people about them, their question often is, who cares? Um, which, oh, I know, yeah. um, believe me, I fought about it. And so that, I think that's my question is, um, what can I bring back to them? What can I tell them about why, you know, using something, using something that is not a movie or a TV show, um, but that is something that you actually do in person, why is that important? How is that still important in 2024 when it was in 1934? 
Boy, <laughs> I I do I do puppet theatre and play this this puppet because it, it's my uh, hmm? uh, uh, my 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 instrument to to talk to other people. I think when when especially when we also perform for children, children are more open and we get a, a direct fe feedback. Um, I think what, what's, what's different with the, with the movies in the, in the theater that the, 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 you, we all have to be active to animate the puppets uh, or this object on the stage. That's something, uh, it depends on the, uh, on the piece and on the puppets, of course. But what, I, what we try to, to do that the, that the children or the adults get active with their own brain to animate that. And mm -hmm. if it if it works, then you, then you, are, you have a uh, then you have an also a conversation with the children after the show. Oh, pff, they're they're open. It's not oh I'm so much impressed by everything what's happening there on on the screen or on the stage. So I think for me it's this moment in puppet theater uh, to activate the the, the let's imagination imagination or the fantasy to to, to do something with, a, with 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 their own brain and with the hands and the fingers that's something still we, we, we still need that oh. and of course it gets more difficult and co complex but it's something different the movies the uh, and uh, that, that has nothing to do with our work I, I, yeah I, similar yeah. I have similar impulse I feel like I I uh, I understand. I understand the impulse. Why, why people say that? I get. I, and I and I feel like, to me, they're meant to be operated, and they're meant to be held, and they're meant to be interacted with. And uh, like, uh, weird to compare it to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which I went to and hated. I thought it was a very boring place to be because it's full of these things that, like, it's mostly guitars, and they should just be played. And to concentrate them in one place m exhausts me. Museums make me tired, too. Um, and, and like, one time I was in uh, Cincinnati, and they were redoing their Natural History Museum, and they didn't have a place to put the thing, so they took all the dinosaurs, and they scattered them around the city. They were all, so everything that was once in one building was in all the buildings all around the city. And one is enough. Like, one is a lot, you know? And, like, uh, so in some ways, it's like the concentration of still inert puppets that people can't play with is, is torture. And, and there's nothing and, scarier and, than a dead and, puppet. And there's something really exciting about, like, can we get the, can we distribute this? Can we get this out, like, to have more, like, intimate, interactive, one on one engagement with it or smaller room engagement with it? Because the truth, if I walk into a room with a bunch of marionettes that I'm not allowed to touch hanging from the walls, like, I don't know how long I can stay in that room. Uh, and that's as a person who just loves them, adores them, but, like, um, w wants to pull them off the wall, you know? I think very much that's that's what I was I was gonna say is that the dead the dead puppet is a scary thing, um, but that the that because they're meant to be touched and played with mm -hmm. and that they that when you have the life I think the important part is seeing is being able to see the m making them uh, as an object um, it's it can be off putting and I think then the idea too that at least uh, the idea of manipulating any object or puppeting any object even if it's not figurative is like a fun sense of play and really I think f for the younger kids especially is, a, is something to nurture and to get going but yeah perhaps the museum could display them with animatronic hands that have and then the and then the technology we'll talk to that guy. so this is what we need we need we need good robots that can a, a articulate a puppet in a museum so that they're not as scary to the people who come and see them i think I, I could help. or hire a puppeteer to always be on hand at the museum would also help that's another thing too okay do we have more questions yes there's one in the back there Um, this question is for all of you, but Michael, you spoke about um, your love of frogs and then later on finding the concrete context for the frogs through the poetry. I was wondering if um, any of you have ever built a puppet or were working on a puppet that 
you're just obsessed with the movement and you don't feel like it needs a concrete context and the movement itself or the existence of the puppet itself is its own context. Of course, it's always different, but uh, um, uh, I find also it's more the, the most um, the schönste, the schönste, the, the, it's most the nicest, the nicest uh, thing is when the things are coming together. So if I not, not I'm not doing that alone. Um, so there's a, a musician comes in, or the director, or dramaturg people, or uh, and everybody brings in. Uh, uh, brings in something, and then something out of these different energies, something oh, something independent starts to work. So it's not only me. Uh, somebody has to start something always. Yes, but so you start to have a, you, in the morning. You have to, ah, I, I would like to build a, a, a frog today. Let's let's do it. Let's do. It. Let's follow this imp first impulse and. Um, and th then a lot of things are coming up. So uh, uh, there are only a few uh, projects uh, we did where the idea was in the beginning, let's tell this story with these puppets and with this style. It always, other things came together. And so oh, you have this puppet and let's see where this for comes there. Um, uh, yeah how to explain this. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, I, uh, to every puppet I can sh show you, I can tell a different story. Uh, uh, and uh, so this, this, this puppet, for example, there was this death puppet, I, I built it more than 20 years ago for a piece where I thought that it was a piece about Robert, but we were working on Robert Schumann's music and about this romantic arts and that I would, I would like to have a puppet like this. And then the puppet was on stage, all the rehearsals, it never went in. And then another rehearsal starts with another project. The puppet was there, and oh, no, it does. It's a nice puppet, but it doesn't work <laughs> here. It doesn't make sense. So it gets older and older. The puppet was always hanging there, and then in, in spleen, the, ah, it's there. Uh, that's that's the moment where the uh, so the lines are very <laughs> different. Um, and I like I like that when when the, when the puppet finds it the own way and says, oh, I can talk I don't talk I I need this or I need the only need music in the in the screen there are puppets who who have no poems they're just there but uh, um, so it's uh, yeah that's <laughs> is it okay. <laughs> yeah. um, I I'd add that I like I like gathering like. Uh, mechanisms and like uh, junk. I hoard. I like have a. I, be, I see. Th I go to the thrift store looking for nothing. I just walk and I find things that I like. Don't know what it's for yet, but I know. Like I had a boot expander for years. It was like a like a little. You, you there was a thing here and it would make this go out. You know. And I was like, I don't know what this is for, but I know that this could go in a puppet and do a cool thing. And so like it just sat on a shelf until it had a need. Um, and then the thing I'd add is like, I, I have an artistic home in uh, Andersonville, the Neo Futurist Theater, and we do short work all the time. And so it can be iterative and I can make a thing, an image, an object, a, a piece that, uh, that I just get in front of people and I like, and, and it doesn't have to be its final form, right? It's just like, um, and I'll probably recycle that impulse in a show we do or, uh, you know, so it does help to have like community and audience and reflection and the ability to get it wrong or not even wrong, just like the first form of right or a zero draft or, you know. Great, so I think this last few questions and answers have really underscored um, something important about the materiality of the puppet, which is that even though we like mechs and they're cool and we like discovering new materials, et cetera, that it's all in service of a story. 
And I think that's where the robotics, um, we're having some difficulty integrating that into the world of puppetry because um, how does that help us tell stories better than what we were doing with just human beings and materials and mechanisms? So I think that's kind of the, the gist of the conversation in the last few minutes. We have still time for some questions, so yes. Uh, so my question is, how has working on the mechanics of the puppets influenced how you think about your own body's movement? Uh, and uh, I guess just the movement of things you use in daily life and vice versa, has, have you become more aware of your body in ways that influence the puppet making process? To the first part, I've had to really increase my core because uh, our particular rig has uh, like an obstruction. So in order to, to access, there's a lot of unnatural leaning that can't fully extend to get other muscles to help. And um, so like there's always a, a, a good knot here that I now know how to stretch and, uh, and work on. So I, I definitely, yeah, some new muscles I've had to develop for that and uh, for the first part, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thoughts? Yeah, I, 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 I started to do, uh, oh, it's, oh, it's incredible what is happening there, especially if you work with, uh, with marionettes, if you <clears throat> find all these points where the energy is coming from, from the, from the balancing and everything, that's so, <laughs> that's so, um, uh, connected to our, we, we, we should work maybe. <laughs> uh, and I'm always excited. Uh, I, I started to work with this Kampf sport and this uh, martial, martial, arts. martial arts, you call it martial yeah. arts, the yeah. fighting with the, um, and, uh, and all these movements that you have there and these exercises. That's, uh, that's the same with the, with the puppets, with this where, where's the turning points? What, where, where's the energy going? Where's the energy stopping? And to to follow the the, the energy, it's a horrible name, the martial art. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, yes. But but there's something very beautiful. Uh, um, also with this with these sticks. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, I try to do that, <laughs> and I'm always inspired to think. Yeah. That's maybe how the puppet uh, uh, can, can go on. <laughs> yeah, that was a beautiful question. And just um, as a reminder, there are some puppet manipulation traditions in which the training consists of learning set forms, just as you would in karate. Um, Bunraku or San Ningurai is one of those. Do we have another question? For, yes, there's someone there. This is fascinating. Um, you, there's a theme I'm hearing emerge, which I'd love to hear you talk about, um, to do with you, um, mechanisms working or not wor working in a way they're not supposed to or not intended. I'm really appreciating what you said about new technologies that don't, <laughs> that are designed for like lifestyle or particular function in the world, but don't work in the hands of an artist, right? And so what the artist wants to do in some ways, I think is, which is our job, right, is to break it, to do it, use it in a way it's not meant to. For example, I, and I love that I've now witnessed another person who goes into thrift stores for no good reason, <laughs> you know, and, and I, it, it finds a weird object that just calls to you, and you're like, this show is not written for you yet, but you are telling me that you want to be in a puppet show, so I need to buy you and keep you on my shelf for a while. <laughs> but what is it, like a, a, sh a shoe stretcher or something you said? Um, but you're not going to use it as a shoe stretcher or whatever that tool is. You're going to use it for something else. So I wonder if you could talk about this idea of breaking or misusing, not abusing, but collaborating with an object or technology in a way that it might be calling you to do that was not its intended purpose. Um, the hack, as it were, the hack. <laughs> That's the hack, hacking, hacking found technology. Yeah, re repurposing things. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind uh, show related and that kind of thing would be uh, 
reading a story that we wanted to adapt, figuring out eventually that the form of it needed to be a clock, and then saying, like, where can I find a cheap like grandfather clock or something like that, you know? And then looking to see what exists and then finding the right one that's like, oh, I could, I could hack this and turn it into images, uh, surfaces that we need. Like, that kind of thing seems to be a great yeah, example of what you might be asking about. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The hack. Yeah. Also, also there, I, maybe that goes a little next. What I, what I, what I was thinking about is um, with this going to shops because for for me it's quite horrible in 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 Germany and Europe at the moment that all these shops are closing down and you mm. buy that in the internet and Amazon and. So you, you you put in oh I need uh, something red and green and it has to be like this and poof, <laughs> so oh, here you can buy it and tomorrow you have it. Uh, um, so it changes for me at, at the moment. Also, um, uh, I called it and now I see all these uh, these internet performances where you see okay it's all from Google uh, the the mm -hmm. set design. Uh, um, uh, um, and I ask myself if 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 I if I, which shop can I go to find to get inspired, if it's not a flea market and you always get these flea market shows, and um, where where are these places uh, to 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 go to in the f in the future? But so I I said no, I would I, I would like next I would really to make a show where you say I don't use no internet at all I buy don't buy anything from the internet let's see what will come out of that. Uh, because also a shop, yeah. To, but it's it works completely different, um, and the research is so uh, so different. But I, I, it's new. It's new. I have no idea. I only see in in, in Stuttgart a lot of places where I, every every week I went there mm -hmm. and get inspired by little little things. Oh, that's an interesting. I was talking to the people in the shop, and they said perhaps this this material. They are gone after Corona. They are all closed down. Mm -hmm. and I stand there and say, no, well, what, what to do now? Uh, I can't go there anymore. Oh, um, so it changed. And I, I, it's not erotic for me to, to buy it, and next morning it lays in front of my door, this, mm -hmm. this electronic device. Yeah, yeah it's there. <laughs> uh, it's, it's not a, I don't get a, it's another, it's another thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm looking forward, well, <laughs> what will happen? with these meeting points. Because <laughs> it's a collaborator, right? The, it's yeah. like, uh, you know, it's a, it, you know, I, I think I've got a thing, I haven't used it yet, but like, it's a buffer. It's a giant buffer. You hold it and it's, spin, it's like a spinning buffer. And I'm like, this is great. I can't believe I can just have one of these, you know? <laughs> um, or like, you know, the little thing where like, it's for people to practice golf in their house, I guess, but it just releases one ball at a time, like this is beautiful. Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, I don't know, did I respond to your question? I, mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I feel this loss. That's, 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 that, those are really good observations and um, we're, we're leaning now into the material side of thing, but um, because of our um, awareness of environmental disaster, there's also more and more reflection on the materials that we use. Puppeteers have used a lot of really toxic materials in the past, but there's also movement towards returning to natural materials. So what if our, our research process shifted from things that we can find in a shop to mm -hmm. things that we could find on a walk in the woods? Yeah. Definitely. I, the few times I've played with like toxic materials, I've had a pretty bad experience. Like I've made stuff I'm proud of that looked, you know, like. Um, but it, I don't know. I I prefer I prefer like reuse materials. I prefer natural materials, stuff we have around. Um, cheese wax. Yeah, yeah, I prefer cheese. Cheese, I prefer cheese, <laughs> cheese paper and cardboard, and mm -hmm. I do use a lot of plastic, both like reused plastic, but like uh, thermoplastics too, like, because 
they're so great. You all know, you like uh, Shape Lock and stuff like that, are people familiar? You can buy beads of plastic that with hot water is becomes malleable, oh. like uh, almost putty, and then you can shape it, and you can drill it and paint it and sand it, and it's great for prototyping, and even longer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, that's an internet thing. I buy that on the internet. <laughs> I'm gonna find like a natural spring of shape. <laughs> that sounds like a horrible <laughs> spring. <laughs> the opposite of this question. <laughs> Not at all. What is the exact question? So, um, just you were reflecting on the loss of this. I'm not gonna say shopping, I'm gonna say research. Mm -hmm. So the experience of going into these shops and researching yeah. different yeah. objects and materials we're, if we're losing that, but we're gaining an awareness of um, ecological impact, could that kind of research shift to like a walk in the woods and what you might find that you could make a puppet with? Yeah, yeah. So what I, what I said with these shops, that they're, they're, they're more technical things. If you need a wire mm -hmm. or something, that's not the, for me, it's not the really the, the puppet. The puppet, to, if I build a puppet, then it's still, very conventional wood and uh, some plaster and something very cheap. Mm -hmm. uh, what I what I what I can can use. It's not, nothing mm -hmm. um, that I, what I buy somewhere with a lot of technique. Um, the basic one would be to, to carve it in wood. Still, mm -hmm. that's uh, uh, that's still the best um, <laughs> the best material. Yes. Wood for me. Okay. Great. So I think we have time for one last question. Is there, okay, come with it. Okay. Can we, well, can you meet Blair in the middle again? Oh, okay, you start. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. So I think a nice maybe finishing question, I'll just sit down here, is what, what can you say to speak to the durability of your puppets and the longevity of puppet theater? Thank you. No, I'm responsible for that. Ours could go at any time. <laughs> Ours are so, I work in my basement, I keep them in the basement, and if I've, I have them out and I'm working, I, I will, I have once in the middle of the night, hearing my heater turn on, had a, just a panic of like, oh, the pipes are gonna blow, and they're gonna soak everything, and I'll lose the whole show. And they're, they're in tubs. I keep them in tubs, but you know, you leave stuff out when you're working. But yeah, it's, they're very delicate. They could, they could rip tomorrow, I have, after the show. <laughs> I'm not good at making puppets to last. I, I, I think once I've gotten the idea out, usually that's, you know, and then put it in front of some people, that's, I got out of it what I wanted, and I want to move on to another thing, so like, Occasionally, a show like this where it's like, oh, we should do this some more. We'll rebuild and like, you know, make improvements and try and make it last longer. But a lot of times, like the, you know, I make a thing that supports the expression at that moment, and I get through that expression, and then kind of move on. Yeah. But there also, there are different. So there are only there are puppets who only live for one show. So they are built in the show or just before the show, and they break but for the show or they burn. Or uh, uh, that's <coughs> so they only have one life, <laughs> and uh, and they're, they're, then once they they get very old, uh, this one, this that my, yeah, they're, 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 I find it amazing to get older with puppets, and uh, um, uh, they, they show you how how we was thinking twenty years ago, and it, you still can go in. That's uh, that's incredible. That's the own dialogue with, uh, ah, that's what, where I was, what I was thinking about. I had, I had one, I can maybe I can t tell this with this, get, getting older and give it to the next. When, when the, this puppeteer, Albrecht Rosa, died, his puppets were still hanging in, the, in his workshop and his assistant, he, he was, she was still living with these puppets. And one day when I was visiting, she, she was, can, can you play? play the puppet, please, for me. And I was watching these puppets my whole life. Yeah? <laughs> so it, 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 take, take it in. I would like to see how it, how it moves again, because she was not playing it. 
and it was spooky. I, after two mi uh, one minute, I, I had to give it away. I said, <laughs> no, I can't do that because you are in the in the brain of another person <laughs> who was yeah. constructing that. So that was a very old old puppet from another from another pu pu puppeteer. So they can got very old, but some if they can can be played. Um, that's my question. Spade and Tovinek, that's possible. They go over get generations, they get played and played. But for Albrecht's puppets, they are <coughs> in a way dead. They are in the museum now. Uh, and so it's mm -hmm. also there, it's very, very different. They can get, okay. they get old. Okay, yeah. so we're ending with death. <laughs> <laughs> we did it! <laughs> Okay, so thank our panelists, thank everyone for coming. Okay. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. I'll get sandwiches, you get the car.